In this video, we're going to be discussing the Stork Standing Test, which is a special test used in the assessment of a spondylolisthesis within the lower lumbar spine. To perform the Stork Standing Test, initially the patient will be positioned in standing, as you see right here, but then the patient's going to be instructed to switch into single limb support, and the non-weight-bearing foot is braced against the medial aspect of the weight-bearing knee. So that will look something like this. And it's exactly how we imagine a stork would stand on one leg. While maintaining this position, the patient is instructed to extend at the lumbar spine. You may need to show the patient with hand placement exactly where you want them to extend or to lean back. And the patient may also drive the arms out forward as a counterbalance. So that'll look something like this. If they don't need their hands for a balance, that's perfectly fine as well. Here's a look at this from the side. There's the stork stance and the lumbar extension. Now a positive stork standing test is going to be indicated by reproduction of familial low back pain, which can either be associated with a spondylolysis or a spondylolisthesis, both of which are conditions in which there's some kind of damage to this structure called the pars interarticularis. And this is a region of the lower lumbar vertebrae in which the facets actually attach to one another. Okay? So if you have just some general damage or a stress fracture of the pars interarticularis, but everything's still connected, that would be called a spondylolysis. And make sure you differentiate that from spondylosis. The term spondylosis is really just a narrowing of the intervertebral distance. So where the vertebrae come closer together, that's really just osteoarthritis of the spine. This is spondylolysis, where you have a stress fracture or minor damage to the pars interarticularis, but everything's still connected. In a spondylolisthesis, notice that there's complete separation of that pars interarticularis. And so now in a spondylolisthesis, you have a slippage of, let's say, the L5 vertebra anteriorly relative to the sacrum, or S1. You don't have that anterior slippage of L5 in the case of the spondylolysis because it's technically still connected at the pars interarticularis. Now this test position right here can certainly be aggravating to a patient with spondylolysis because they still have damage there at the pars interarticularis. However, we might expect the symptoms and the pain, etc., to be more severe if the patient has a full spondylolisthesis because now you have a complete break there of that pars interarticularis and now you have this anterior subluxation of L5 relative to the sacrum. And the patient may also report a feeling of instability in this area due to that subluxation of L5 relative to S1. However, subjective reports are just that. They are subjective, so you can't necessarily rely on them for differentiating these two conditions. A gold standard would certainly be an x-ray or an MRI. However, you might be able to get a better idea if it's a spondylolysis versus a spondylolisthesis by spring testing, specifically around L4. So... Suppose you have the patient in prone and you apply a PA force to the spinous process of L4. So you push L4 anteriorly, and because L4 is connected to L5, you're also really pushing L5 anteriorly, and because of the lordosis in that region of the spine, those segments are so close together that if you push L4, you're going to get some L5 as well. But in the case of a spondylolysis, this segment is still technically intact, and so you shouldn't have any excessive hypermobility relative to the other regions of the lumbar spine. However, in the case of spondylolisthesis, now you have a full separation at that pars interarticularis. Now, there's a tendency for L5 to sublux anteriorly. So if I apply that PA force to the L4 spinous process and push L4 anteriorly, well, L4 is connected to L5, and they're already very close together. So you may be able to detect a little bit of hypermobility in the anterior direction because there's a tendency now for L5 to sublux forward. Let's look at this test in real time one more time. So the patient's going to move into single limb support, and the non-weight-bearing foot, in this case the right side, is going to be braced against the medial aspect of my weight-bearing knee, which is on the left side. From this stork standing position, the patient's going to be instructed to extend at the lumbar spine. You can always use the arms in front as a counterbalance, or you may not have to. 
and you're looking for reproduction of familiar low back pain. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.